Okay. All right, this is an interview at the Elderwood Senior Center, Hamburg, New York, the 21st of April, 2005, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, Gerald Mendresa, M-E-N-D-R-Y-S-A, 2-1941. And where? Where were you born? I was born in Lackawanna, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Educational background, St. Barbara's Grammar School, Baker Victory High School, and one year of business school at Brighton Strand. Okay. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Yes, no, I was drafted. Okay. All right, what branch of service did you enter and when? I was, I was in the Army, November 21st, 1963. Okay, where did you go for your basic training? Basic training was Fort Dix, New Jersey. How long? Uh, I was there for approximately, oh, we had eight weeks of basic training, and after that I became permanent party, and I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey for approximately uh, six months after that. And then uh, uh, when the uh, Levin Air Assault Division in Fort Benning, Georgia was uh, uh, was being formed. Uh, uh, I had gotten transferred to Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, Division Headquarters G2, and I was there until the inception of the 1st Air Cav Division. What they did was they combined the 2nd Infantry Division and the 11 Air Assault Division, which was a uh, helicopter outfit that was uh, uh, McNamara's, uh, uh, Defense Secretary McNamara's baby, that was his, his idea for, for NAM, and uh, I, uh, I worked at G2 for a period of time, and then I, uh, uh, I got transferred to uh, the 91st Military Intelligence, and, uh, and I was with the 91st Military Intelligence. Uh, I was only one of two enlisted men that worked the war room, which included uh, uh, three generals and all officers, and uh, myself and a, and a young man from California were the only, like I say, the only two enlisted men. Now, now what do you mean by the war room? The war room was the pre-planning uh, uh, before uh, the movement into Vietnam. Uh, we we had maps. We everything was planned that was going to transpire at the time. In other words, we were preparing for the buildup under the Johnson administration, and uh, it was a uh, top secret security uh, war room. Uh, the uh, anything that was done in the room was left in the room, and uh, I felt. Uh, I felt pretty honored by, by being only one of two, two enlisted personnel. That's How did you get selected for this, do you know? Uh, I think it was mainly because I worked at uh, G2 mm -hmm. uh, Division Headquarters and then got transferred into the military intelligence. And uh, uh, they wanted to have uh, a personnel for military intelligence and they selected me to, to be part of the war room. Who was your MOS? Uh, Actually, my MOS was a, a clerk typist. Uh, that's that's how I first started out in uh, uh, in Fort Dix. That's did you a, did you go to school for that in on the Army side or uh, no? No, I didn't. Uh, I, it was part of my training out of uh, Brighton Strand. Okay, so you went directly from right. basic into that MOS. Right. That what they did is they put me into MOS, uh, same MOS uh, at the time, and I believe it or not, I used to give. Uh, uh, clerk typist uh, exams when I was permanent party at, at Vortex. Okay. But uh, the war one was, was very, very interesting. Uh, some of the planning, some of the things you would, wouldn't even think of that how a, a group of people could put their minds in, in all in the same frame of mind and uh, to, to accomplish some of the things they wanted to do. Uh, we uh, were allowed to come home prior to uh, uh, 
uh, being deported. Uh, we were allowed to come home for three days. We couldn't even tell our parents at the time that where we were headed and what was going on, just that we were, we we're leaving the United States. I was on the uh, advance party uh, that went into Nam. Uh, originally we, we went into uh, the train and uh, we spent about a week in the train. Now, when, when was that? If you know. uh, that was 65. Mm -hmm. That was 65. Went into the train at that time and we were there for about a week. Uh, at one point it looked like I was going to be attached to uh, uh, an Air Force team in the train, but they decided that uh, the personnel would be better off being in the Central Highlands than on K. So uh, what we did is we went into uh, on K and uh, set, up, set up the whole operations for the rest of the division to come in. The rest of the division came in about uh, uh, three months later. Now, was there a base already established there, or no. was it being established? No, it was being established at the time. Did you receive any opposition? Uh, at the time, yeah, we uh, mostly uh, hostile fire, mm -hmm. uh, some some grenade fire, launch grenade fire, uh, but it was a sporadic type thing. Uh, the The biggest uh, setup was that a, the biggest attack occurred when we were at a uh, a temporary base when we were clear in the area for uh, in on K uh, they had a we had an airstrip set up and uh, and, a, and a chopper pad set up and uh, it, just to show you they knew Americans had to eat and they knew that Americans like to take showers and those were the those were the times that seemed like they tried converging and, and doing doing the most damage Mm -hmm. They were very, very antiquated type people. They they used anything. Their psychological point of view was, don't kill you, wound you, because now we're going to take two people out of you. Because somebody's going to take care of you to get you out of the way because you're hurt. Mm -hmm. And they used anything and everything they could from bow and arrows. It was, it was amazing. But the big thing was, I don't, think, I don't think they even knew who they were fighting. They, you talk to some of the people that, that were captured, and they still thought that they were fighting the French. Uh, they still had a lot of landmines off the airstrip that we you know, didn't even bother. We cleared some of them. What they, what they did is had an automatic controlled uh, bulldozer. And that's how we used to clear the landmines, so send the bulldozer in. And then the, right after that, we ended up setting up, uh, camp was pretty much cleared. Uh, we brought in a lot of the villagers uh, to help us clear because we were just the advanced party and numbers were very, uh, were very low uh, for, for the manpower that was needed at the time. So you used a lot of local labor. Then. Yes, yeah, a lot of local. And uh, after the place was uh, set up and the uh, and the full division come in, uh, we learned that we had to start moving around some of our uh, our foxholes, uh, moving around some of our armored equipment, because what they were doing is some of the people that were working with us were work actually working against us at night. So uh, you'd have to keep move, moving these around. Uh, uh, Central Highlands was good. We set up a, a helipad. There was a huge hill, and uh, we set up a helipad with lights up on this hill, and we could put two choppers up there. And uh, uh, there was no way anybody could really get up this hill for uh, you know because of security. But it was good for us because the choppers could take off and give us protection. But uh, firepower, uh, the, the big thing was they didn't have air power. That was, that was the biggest thing there. We mm -hmm. had the air power and uh, they never had that capabilities. Um, people, people turned against a lot of returning veterans uh, because of things that happened with women and children. 
what they didn't realize, there was children as young as eight years old that could take a weapon, tear it apart, and put it back together faster than me and you could. And uh, when you see stuff like this happen, uh, uh, you, say to your, you say to yourself, well, I want to go home. So you got to do what you got to do. And people couldn't realize that at the time. So um, I was pretty happy. I, wor I worked in a in a war, the war tent. Uh, uh, when the uh, main division came in, I used to uh, do all the plotting for all sites. We used to do recce sites. A recce was a uh, one and two man plane. Uh, would would take photography of an area. Most of the time, if you, if you had two people in there, the, the second person would have to lay on their stomach. And uh, there was a window where they used to get... Now, what kind of portions. aircraft was this? Uh, reconnaissance flight. Small, small aircraft. Uh, no fighter plane. Just This a, was a, a fixed wing aircraft? Uh, yeah, fixed wing. Okay. And they used to take pictures, of aerial, get aerial views, then bring in sightings. And uh, what I'd do is I'd post the sightings uh, for, say, a chopper company or chopper uh, outfit that was going to be going in that area at the time and uh, uh, you'd present them with a map uh, two three hours before they were going to depart and they had all the sightings in that area or activity that was was in the area. It was really interesting and if I ever decided to make a career definitely want to stay in uh, intelligence. Uh, it was it was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was daily life like? Your rations, your your weapons, um, your equipment. It w it was hard at first because uh, the temperatures were were up. Uh, it was nothing to hit uh, 115, 116 degrees at time. Uh, you had your your dry heat at times, and then you had your torrential rains, where it rained sometimes a, a week at a at a time, and. Uh, as far as firepower, our our weapons used to jam up all the time. They, uh, now, what uh, did you have, the 14 or the M16? Uh, no, we had the M16s, and then they converted them. They, mm -hmm. uh, what they did is they, they changed part of the, the, the weapon where you could, at first you could never ride around into the chamber on the uh, M16s, and they come out with an AR-16 where you used to be able to ride around into the chamber itself and you didn't have to worry about it about it jamming but uh, the guns used to jam up from the heat and the dampness uh, they were partially made of fiberglass and uh, if you sent off a couple clips most of the guys after a while learned you used to have to wear a glove because it got so hot from the, from the rounds uh, the the only benefit, the really benefit that I uh, I got by going by the advanced party, I learned a lot sooner than the division that would come in after us to tell when the round was going out, when something was going out, and when something was coming in. When the division got there, guys were jumping around all the time, you know, and uh, you know they'd say to a few of us, "Well, how can you just later?" Well. We already knew by the sound when the round was going out, and uh, they learned. You know, it took it took a little while, and uh, but it it was interesting. We worked with the uh, Korean Rock Division. Uh, Korean Rock Division was uh, had a few more benefits than we did. Uh, they had they had beer be long before we got beer. They showed us how to cool beer in 115 degree weather. Uh, now how was that accomplished? Uh, you know what they did? They uh, they actually took it and put it in uh, in gasoline. They took took a bottle of beer, put it in gasoline and twirled it. And uh, from the alcohol being in the uh, uh, the menthol being in the uh, in the gasoline, mm -hmm. it's, it ended up making it colder. Huh. Okay, made your beer cold. Now did you have uh, the same uniforms you had stateside, or did you have the jungle no, no, fatigues? No, we, we went to went to fatigues. All our we had no white. Everything, uh, your t-shirts, your shorts, your socks were all were all dyed green or 
later on they, they just issued uh, a, a fatigue type green uh, mm -hmm. outfit, but the advance party we, we dyed everything before we went over. Uh, no jewelry, uh, glasses, uh, uh, you even tinted down your glasses. Uh, what they did is, uh, well you didn't have, you had a dark rim type glass, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, anything, any type of reflection uh, where, like I say, with the sporadic fire, uh, didn't make any difference. You know, it could be early in the day, it could be late at night. Uh, now, now, being in intelligence and, and in the, the war room area, did you carry a weapon at all yeah, times? Did you have time. a sidearm? Yeah, we, had, we were authorized to carry a weapon at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, when the advance party first came over, we could carry a weapon, but it couldn't be loaded at the time until we got comfortable with the situation. And they did the same thing with the uh, uh, division when they come in, okay, they, they were not allowed to, uh, to load their weapons. Uh, they could carry loaded clips, but they couldn't, couldn't load their weapon and, uh, you know, until the situation ar arose and same, same thing, until they got comfortable. Uh, we did have some of our servicemen unfortunately get wounded from some of our own people. But that was just because of, you know, uh, maybe because some of our troops were younger at the time, uh, maybe just the situation in itself. Everybody isn't always right for a certain situation. Did you ever wear a flak jacket at all? All the time. All the time. All the time. You, if you went, you went to eat, you wore it. If you, if you went to the john, you wore it. Uh, and if you didn't, shame on you. It, all the time. Uh, we originally went there, we had a normal type boot that we used to wear and uh, talk about antiquated stuff. What they used to do is uh, they used to make what they called uh, uh, bungee sticks. And uh, they were sharpened edges and they were set up like a spring. And what they do is they take uh, bamboo pit viper uh, venom and put it on the edge of the tip. And they'd always set them up like on little pads where you had to jump over, maybe a small little water jump over and they'd, they'd set it up there. Well, what was happening is this, the, the sharpened edges would go into your foot and because of the, uh, the venom from the snake, the, it, was a, it was a very small snake, but you had approximately 20 seconds to live if you ever got bit directly by it. Okay, it's one of the most poisonous snakes uh, to be known. But their mouth size is so small, the only place that they can really bite you is maybe on an earlobe, or uh, if if they got up on your face, mm -hmm. on, your, on the bottom of your nose, uh, because their bite was so small. So what they did is took the venom, and a lot of people, when, uh, when a division got there, a lot of people were you know, got hit with the, the sharpened bungee sticks and the venom got in their system and there was their way again. We don't want to kill you because we want to take two people out of the war instead of one. So after a while the government issued a, a higher boot and what it had is it had steel shank in it, in the, in the boot. So if you did get hit, it, it just deflect or, or break. It was amazing. They used to set up, if they knew that you had an area where a helicopter could land, they would actually set up a huge bow and arrow in a tree made out of a, a sharpened, sharpened tree, rounded tree, and just the, uh, the propulsion from the, uh, the chopper blade would set it off when it come in to land, and it actually pierced the helicopter in itself. Uh, later, later on, they started getting uh, some better weapons, uh, a lot of Russian SKS weapons were uh, infiltrating the country, uh, a lot more bayonets from from Russia and China were were coming in. Matter of fact, I I still believe I got one of the bayonets that I brought home with me from off an SKS. The, uh, 
it seemed like the people that were drafted seemed to adapt a little bit easier. Uh, and what I mean by easier is they, they accepted what the situation was. And I think it was only because of age, uh, they were a little bit older, uh, they were a little bit more established, they had either a, a start of the family or they've had uh, a job, uh, a secure job. And uh, I think it's like anything else, you know, the younger you are, you're a little bit more immature, maybe a little bit more wild, but uh, the, the organization, the division, uh, I got to say that most of that division had to be had to be hand picked. Okay, when it, when it was established, because you had people from California, you had people from North Carolina, you had, uh, New York, Indiana, and when you got to talk to these people and really know these people, you you find out that they were they were from different walks of life. But, but yet their age was older. They're, they were a little bit more secure back home. And uh, that's, I don't know, I, I might be wrong by saying that, but uh, it, it, I always felt that way, you know, they were. Uh, so you were, you're saying that they weren't drafting that many 18, 19 year olds? They were, no. They were older no, than that. They were older people, yeah. I was, I was in my, I was like 20, 23 years old mm -hmm. at the time. And I, I, I still say that has, has a lot to do with it. You know, you, you, you still got some of that wildness in you, but you, you lost the, some of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, was your unit racially mixed? Uh, Pretty much. Yeah, we were. Uh, were there any problems at all within? Uh, gee, I had, uh, uh, we had a we had a softball team uh, back in Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, uh, we were we had we had no problems. You know, you, you end up forgetting sometimes. You you become so close with with some of the people that you work with and and play ball with. Uh, we used to go into Georgia, you know, and I had a real good friend of mine, his name was Billy Dutrell, and he was out of Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh was a lot like Lackawanna, mm -hmm. steel town. And uh, so I'd say, come on, payday, let's go. So we'd go into town and, you know, Billy would say to me, well, you know, I can't go any farther than this because Georgia just automatically outlawed uh, black people at the time. They, they just wouldn't let you go past a certain a certain line. It was like a Mason-Dixon line. They, would, they wouldn't let you, you know, and, and it was hard for me to accept, and it was hard for Billy to accept, being from, you know, the areas we're in. Uh, it, that, was, that was never a problem, never a problem. Uh, later on when the division came in, there, there was some problems. It seemed like, uh, for some reason, maybe because they were younger, uh, they did have a lot of problems with, uh, with, with blacks that were, uh, they just, for some reason, uh, they didn't want to be there. And uh, um, a lot of them were, the MPs had them when they used to bring them through the child line. And uh, they were just being, they were waiting to be get, get sent back to the United States. They just didn't want to want to be there to start with. I, I don't know why. Uh, don't don't get me wrong. You know I'm far from being any, you know uh, racially prejudiced, but it, it seemed like there was more at the time I was there more more blacks than whites that were uh, sort of reneging on their responsibility at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it was alleviated later on, I I couldn't tell you. You know I imagine it was. Now you said uh, you had a funny experience with a, a trade for a box of cigars. Could you tell oh, us yes. about that? Oh yes, yeah. I, I, we were sleeping on the ground at the time, still sleeping on air mattresses, and I happened to run into uh, somebody I knew from, uh, I don't believe he was either from West Seneca or Orchard Park, and he was in supply, 
and we got talking, and uh, he says, "Hey, how would you, how would you like a, a cut?" And uh, I said, "Boy, that's great." So he says, "I'll take care of the situation for you, right?" So he ends up bringing me a cut, and I had a cut. So the colonel used to come in every day, you know, to uh, to check the troops, see what they're you know, how they felt, if everything was okay, uh, 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 mainly more interested in their morale, you know, to see what it was like. So he'd come in one day and he stopped at my, my bunk. I was at the first, first one on the right-hand side when you come in. He stopped and he looked and he went around, talked around, and he come up to me and he says, Soldier, could I talk to you a minute? I says, yes, sir. And he came outside and he asked me, what would it take? For me to get one of those because the colonel was still sleeping on the ground <laughs> and uh, I told him I said well sir I said you know I, I like cigars <laughs> and he says I will I will do what I can he says as a matter of fact I'm going on a little trip he says to to check out an area how would you like some manila cigars I says love them sir when he came back from the trip his cot was sitting in his in his tent, and I got my I got my Manila cigars. It was, <laughs> it was just just to show you the way you could actually work together mm -hmm. and and break some of the monotony that was there, uh, some of the situations uh, that at times you respected him as an officer, but he was still a human being like you. Okay, that you were there to do something, and uh, that's what you did. I, uh, I, had a, I had a captain that I met from uh, Batavia in New York, and uh, he was married to a, a German young lady, and she used to send him chocolate-covered cherries, and they had cognac in it. And he knew I liked cognac, so every time he'd get a box in, he'd call me over after work hours, he'd say, come on, I got a little gift, right? So the first time I went over, you know, I didn't know what to expect. He says, try one of these, see if you like them, right? So as soon as I'd been into him, you know, it lit up with a smile, and he, he looked at me, he says, I figured you'd like that. But uh, we did. We had, a, we had a good working relationship. Uh, uh, the officers had to do what they had to do at times, and, uh, but they were, they were pretty decent with us. They, uh, they realized, too, that uh, we were only going to be there for a certain period of time, and they were going to lose us because... Not too many people, not not too many people extended. They uh, they did approach me. They offered me a increase in rank. Uh, at the time, they had me working in uh, an E seven slot, and I was only a, a spec four at the time. And they offered me a promotion, and uh, I I was honest with them. I, I said they they told me about extend for for ninety days. They'd give me a promotion, and uh, they didn't want to lose me you know, at the time. And I, I said, sir, I wouldn't extend for 90 seconds, and you know that. And he broke out with a smile, and he knew. So uh, on the way back home, it took a while. Uh, couldn't get out of Saigon. We couldn't get any flights. So, which, they were doing things that I didn't like there. Uh, somebody pre-warned me about it. What they were doing was taking them in that... Uh, that were waiting in a holding area to come back to the United States, they had them actually doing KP duty. They had them washing dishes and everything. I understand somebody's got to do it, but I don't. I don't think that was right. Uh, you know, here your troops are just coming out of a a war area, and uh, I think they should have been treated a little bit better at the time. They shouldn't shouldn't have been given you know a job to do. Well, maybe they did it for to get their mind off of things because there was a delay, like I say, there were very few airlines, uh, flights going back to the states, uh, most, of, most of the flights going back to the states were either carrying uh, uh, choppers uh, that they were looking to get repaired or some were carrying bags, uh, bringing some of our people back that never made it. So what they used to do is they used to Depending on the number of people that they could put on a flight and be safe, that's what they were doing. They were piecemeal and sending the people back. So uh, it ended up I got back. Uh, I got back Thanksgiving Day. Uh, a 
of 65. Uh, the news media come around at the time and I, I gave them just a, a small article in, uh, for the Buffalo Evening News at the time. I, uh, I had my family with me and uh, I, I told them that... Oh, were you married time, before you... No, I wasn't. Oh, I was okay. single. Yeah. Oh, okay. You mean your parents? And yeah. Parents. I was with my parents and uh, my sister and a couple of my nieces and nephews. And, uh, but it was funny. The day, the day after I got drafted, I'll never, I'll never forget the date because I was, I was standing in line at Fort Dix uh, getting a clothing issue. That's all I had on was a t-shirt, a skibby shorts, and a pair of combat boots when the announcement come across that the president got, got shot. And uh, at the time we were in some conflict with Cuba and I thought to myself, well here we go, right off the bat at the time when Kennedy got shot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm here anyhow. Mm -hmm. I'm back and I could talk about it. So you, uh, there were no demonstrations at the time you left the service? No. No, there, um, at the time there wasn't. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about them when, when they cropped up later on? Well, it was, it was a tough situation because uh, there was so much exposure that it was nothing but a political war at the time. And I can't say I didn't see part of that. Uh, there were times where we had uh, huge VC on the run and we knew where they were at, and we, our people had them at, uh, we had them on a run, and all of a sudden, they were pulling our troops back. Well, guys are saying, well, gee, we got them. Why, why are we pulling our troops back? Mm -hmm. Now, now is the time to, to, to do what we had to do. And um, it was, it was obvious in certain, in certain situations what was, so even when you were there that early, there were rules oh, yeah. of engagement that oh, yeah. were being yeah. established, already established. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you think they harm? They were harmful to uh, the to our the troops war? Men the mentally, troops. mentally to our troops, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. You're, you know, you're you're telling your troops, well, you got a job to do, and when they're out there doing a the job, okay, and then somebody's saying, well, we don't want you to do that anymore. They're saying, well, wait a minute. You know, you got to have mixed feelings and say, well, what do they really want us to do if that's the situation? Mm -hmm. um, got an opportunity to, uh, uh, to meet Teddy Kennedy. Uh, while I was over there, he'd come to pay a visit with the troops. Uh, uh, we had uh, a, lot of, a lot of troops from his area, from the Boston area at the time. he come in and uh, they... Uh, a representative from California was with them at the time. Uh, was he a, a senator at the time? He was a senator at the okay. time, yeah. Uh, and uh, they got a little bit nervous because he spent so much time in our area that they were afraid that uh, they'd pick up uh, the information and get picked up and that the area could possibly get hit. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, uh, it was it was nice, you know. He asked us a lot of questions. Asked, you know, if we're being treated okay about the food. Uh, you could see that he was he was concerned, mm -hmm. and uh, just I, I got the opportunity to get some pictures taken with him, and uh, but there was there was some good with some bad. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to see any USO shows? Uh, no. No, nothing was established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured yeah. that was early. Because we were actually right on the ground floor mm -hmm. when, when the build-up. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we had the, uh, the Screaming Eagles were there ahead of us, and then uh, we come in, and then the Korean Rock Division come in, and then uh, the Big Red One come in, and uh, just little by little as they, they built up. But, uh, this was this was all under the Johnson administration when they when they made the announcement, the original announcement. Type. Now, did you spend a full year over there? Uh, no, I was under under a year because I was with the advance party, okay. and my ETS time was coming up, and it was one of the first things they announced with the advance party when we got there. Nobody would have their ETS dates extended. Uh, 
they said that uh, they, they made sure they let everybody know that they are being brought over on the advance party, okay, to establish grounds and get everything set up as fast as we could. And uh, uh, they would make sure that they had bodies to come in and take our place and uh, that nobody would stay over. And like I said, the only reason I was there the three extra days was uh, uh, just couldn't get aircraft to go in, you know, out of the uh, out of Saigon and coming back to the States. Mm -hmm. Did you get any sort of in-country R&R or anything no, like that? No, nothing, nothing at all at the time. Okay. We put in we put in a place from 12 to 16 hours a day. And uh, on a Saturday, they tried taking care of you a little bit, you know, do an eight hour uh, if they had somebody there. But if they had an uh, operation going at the time, uh, you were there, mm -hmm. you were there for that. Even back in the States, we put in, we worked six days a week in the States. I was lucky if I got home, most of the time we ate at Main Post when we were at Fort Benning. We used to go to, we found that the, believe it or not, the, uh, uh, the lockup was the best place to go eat the food. That was the best food in the whole post. So we used to go there to eat all the time because we'd be working those six, eight o'clock at night all the time. We were there all the time before we went over. And uh, then we worked a half a day on Saturdays. No Saturdays off. You, you worked a half a day on Saturday and a half a day was, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. It all depends what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that you uh, had a lower uh, lobe of your lung. Uh, yes, I did. Taken off. Now you thought maybe you were, were you exposed to Agent Orange while you were there? Or? Uh, a lot of the foliage went on in the area at mm -hmm. the time, but naturally you weren't aware of what it, what it really mm -hmm. was. Uh, the only thing it was doing it, uh, the cover was so heavy they had to they had to bring something in. Uh, so as you were building the base, then they were defoliating around right, the base. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I uh, I did put some application in for for the Agent Orange uh, at the time. Uh, I got rejected, and uh, they uh, they went ahead and said that uh, if I want to pursue the case, to hire my own attorney to pursue the case, and I just left it there at the time. Mm -hmm. Now I know uh, this happened after you left, but uh, and it's because it's making so much news now. What do you feel? How do you feel about Jane Fonda and, and what's happening with this? I, her book signing and so on now. She's not even a part of my life. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. She wasn't there when you were there. She so, not. Yeah. I was just curious if you had a reaction. Yeah. Um, when when were you finally discharged? Uh, I was discharged on. Uh, November 24th, 1965. Okay. Um, I, I know you're... How did you... Uh, did you use a GI Bill at all? After you... Uh, yeah, I did. I, I did some uh, uh, electrical stuff. Uh, uh, it was a, a home course that I was taking. Mm -hmm. I probably got about three quarters through it, and uh, then I dro end up dropping out of the course uh, uh, what I did was I, my job at Bethlehem Steel at the time was a little bit leery. Steel industry has peaks and valleys for a lot of years. So I ended up taking a civil service exam uh, for a, a custodian in, in Lackawanna. I passed the exam and I, uh, I ended up getting in, a, in an area where they finally reached me. So. I never end up losing my job at Bethel Steel, and I got a little bit too many years in a civil service job, so I ended up working two jobs uh, for 25 years, mm -hmm. and uh, it's paying off now. Uh, I, I don't regret it. The only thing I regret is uh, I wish I could have spent more time with my daughter. Uh, my daughter's 30 years old now, but uh, you know, for sometimes the Financial gains uh, aren't worth what you lose. They grow so fast, yeah. the children today. Yeah. And uh, the only thing I'm glad about is uh, she's a good kid. Mm -hmm. I know your answer to this one, but did you ever become involved in any veterans organizations? Oh, <laughs> many. I, uh, I belonged to the American Legion uh, uh, for 40 years. I, I belonged to uh, 
uh, Colonel Weber. I was the first Vietnam veteran to join Colonel Weber post mm -hmm. in my one. And uh, I belong. Uh, I belong to the Moose Club. I belong to uh, uh, Father Baker Knights of Columbus. Uh, I I was a uh, Democratic committeeman for 20 years in, in politics. I was president of the union for 20 out of 25 years. Uh, I stayed active in the community. I uh, I know a lot of people. Uh, I I like people. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Um, yeah, uh, I was. There was a guy by the name of uh, Mike Petro. Uh, he was out of Ohio. Uh, we used to have contact together. Uh, uh, Mike Lovezzo out of California. Uh, we stayed in contact. Mike was uh, a clerk in uh, G3 at the time when we were at Fort Benning, and I was I was in G2. And uh, he would he played ball with us too, uh, so uh, we we stayed in contact for quite a while. But but over the over the years we end up losing it. I uh, uh, I always look to see if there's any any reunions. I, I always watch watch the back of the magazines, and uh, uh, we haven't none whatsoever. You know, I always look for. First Air Cab or Eleven Air Assault Division or 90, 91st Semi. And uh, but uh, but nothing. Uh, uh, but where you, you know, it, it, I think as as you get older, you you establish a family. You you sort of sort of lose that contact that mm -hmm. you that you had over years. It's a shame that it happens, but uh, I guess uh, everybody's got their own life to you know to live. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, uh, I think it took a little bit of the uh, vinegar I had left in me. I think it, you know, it settled me down a little bit, uh, made me a little bit more level-headed. Uh, not that I was. A rebel rouser or anything, but uh, I always enjoyed sports, and uh, sports were number one to me. So especially softball. Softball was mm -hmm. that was my that was my baby, and uh, I learned that there were other things besides sports. Uh, you know, uh, when you when you came home, uh, naturally you're you're happy that you were home. Uh, I had a a uh, fellow that lived uh, like four blocks away from me, uh, he had like 16 days left to come home and he stepped, stepped on a landmine and blew his arm off. And, uh, you know, I always said, well, you know, first of all, what are, what are people with such a short period of time left to come home still be in there, you know? And what happens is the rotation system sometimes uh, doesn't come as soon as you want that you can take mm -hmm. these people out of the field and uh, you still need the manpower and uh, if the rotation system doesn't come fast enough, uh, people that are short timers to come back home are still out there mm -hmm. and uh, it was a shame that happened. Uh, uh, he's, he's in real bad shape right now. He ended up losing both his legs and mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was just from all complications from, from losing his arm. Okay, well thank you very much for your interview. Thank you, thank you for having me.